Hello and welcome back to Craig Fay Builds a Clock. I'm your host, Craig Fay. I'm the guy building the clock. And I wanted to start off today by addressing a couple lies that I told in the last episode. So some of you may have picked up on the fact that I started this series by telling you that I wasn't an expert and then proceeded to give a whole bunch of math and physics equations. And you were probably like, well, this guy clearly knows more than he's letting on. So in the interest of full disclosure, in addition to being a stand-up comedian, in addition to being a podcaster, I am also a mechanical engineer, which is somebody who designs mechanical devices. And next to a clockmaker and a watchmaker is probably one of the more qualified professions to be doing this sort of thing. But I am going to double down on not being an expert because, yeah, sure, I've got an entire shelf full of textbooks that tell me I was taught all of these things at some point. But that was over 13 years ago. I've never done this professionally. I haven't looked at that since. And so I'm really learning everything again for the first time. And hopefully, again, by the end of this episode, I have screwed up enough to prove to you that I really have no idea what I'm doing. The second lie I wanted to address was the fact that I told you that in order to tell time, we need something that's moving with a constant rotational speed. So that's true for the kinds of clocks that we're used to seeing, things with minute hands and hour hands and things like that, but isn't strictly necessary. So in this episode, we're going to learn why that is the case and how ancient cultures exploited this to build some of the very first timekeeping devices ever created. And hopefully along the way, that's going to give us a little insight into how to solve the problem of how to turn the constant force and constant acceleration provided by our power source into the constant speed we need to tell time. To recap, our power source uses a falling weight to spin a shaft. And thanks to this guy, we know that anything that is falling uh, will fall at the same rate regardless of how heavy it is. So if you have a baseball and a bowling ball and you drop them from the same height, they are going to hit the ground at the exact same time. Of course, I don't have a bowling ball and a baseball just lying around my apartment to demonstrate this. Uh, so let's try, oh, I don't know, a uh, five pound weight and a balled up sock. Perfect. So since weight doesn't matter, you can see that dropping anything from a specific height is always going to take the same amount of time. So in this sense, our clock can already tell time. As long as you raise that weight of the power source to a certain height, it's always going to take a certain amount of time to fall. If you need to increase that time, you just increase the height. So in theory, we could just be throwing bricks off of a tall building and measuring time that way by saying something like, meet me in 40 brick falls. Yeah, obviously don't try this at home. That's incredibly dangerous and also impractical, which is why ancient cultures all over the world all came up with the idea to use water. Using water to tell time is a great idea and represented one of the most accurate ways to tell time for thousands of years. This is a clepsedra or a water clock. I'm going to use the term water clock because the more often I have to say clepsedra, the longer this is going to take to film. So very simply, it is a jug filled with water with a spout at the bottom and gravity is still pulling that water down. So in that sense, it is very similar to our falling weight, but the spout at the bottom restricts the flow of the water and slows it down. So to measure time, you simply fill up the jug and see how long it takes to drain out. So this type of water clock is called an outflow water clock because the water is flowing out of it. This is actually pretty accurate. I filled it up and drained it a bunch of times and found that if I filled it up to about 5.5 centimeters above the spout, it would take one minute to drain. And this is really great for measuring specific amounts of time. Like if you are in court and you want to make sure that everyone has the same amount of time to speak, 
or if you are a guard guarding something in the middle of the night and you need to know when your shift is over, or if you are playing a game of boggle and you wanna make sure everyone has the same amount of time to find words. The problem with an outflow water clock is when we need to measure different increments in time. So you might think if we need to measure half the amount of time, we only need to use half the amount of water. Or if we need to measure double the amount of time, we need to use double the amount of water. But draining half the amount of water doesn't take 30 seconds. It actually takes closer to 40 seconds. And draining double the amount of water doesn't take two minutes. It actually takes less than a minute and a half. And that's because the flow rate changes as the jug empties. And we can see this if you compare them side by side. It's a powerful stream at the beginning, but slows to a trickle at the end. And that's because in the beginning, the water at the outlet has all the weight of the water above it pushing down on it. And that's what we know as pressure. So the higher the pressure, the faster the water is forced out of the spout. But at the end, we have almost no water above the spout. So the pressure is lower and the water flows slower. Now we could fix this if we could keep the height of the water the same the whole time. And to accomplish this, we are going to use an inflow water clock. So instead of measuring how long it takes water to drain out of a container, we're now measuring how long it takes to fill a container. Now, in this setup, we have our jug with water pouring in the top to continuously replenish the water that is flowing out the spout at the bottom. Uh, in ancient times, they would have used another jug to pour the water in, um, but I'm just using my tap because why not? The jug also has an overflow. Uh, it's a hole cut in the back. So if the water ever gets too high, the water will flow out the back, maintaining the height of the water at the same level and keeping the flow right out of the spout consistent. It's worth mentioning that we have now accomplished what we have set out to do. We have built a clock powered by gravity that runs at a constant speed. Now this isn't rotational speed. Uh, it's not, where it's not going to provide a certain number of rotations every second. Instead, it's providing a certain volume of water every second. So in our case, it's about 13.1 milliliters per second or roughly about 800 milliliters a minute. And what this allows us to do is measure smaller increments of time that aren't necessarily marked out on our clock. So now if the water is halfway between the one minute and two minute mark, we now know that that is a minute and a half, which is not something we could have done with our outflow water clock. And hey, good news, if you want to experiment with your own inflow water clock, uh, you don't even have to build one. You actually already have one ready to go in your house. That's right, your toilet is a water clock. You see, there is a float in the tank that will shut the flow of water off once it reaches a certain height. So as long as the water pressure in your bathroom stays pretty much the same, uh, the flow of water into the tank will be constant, which means that it will take the same amount of time to fill every time. In my case, it was about 18.3 seconds, but try it for yourself and let me know how it goes. The inflow water clock works really well, and to be honest, it's gonna be probably one of the most accurate clocks that we build in this series. So if it works, if it gets the job done, why would I, or civilization for that matter, worry about building anything more complicated than a peanut butter jar with a straw jammed into it? Well, Despite being one of the best ways to tell time for thousands of years, water clocks are not without their problems. Their biggest one is that water clocks use water. And unless you live in the tropics, there is a pretty good chance that for at least a small portion of the year, water will freeze. And speaking as a Canadian, uh, winters often feel like they are dragging on forever, but if you were measuring time using a water clock, uh, they would literally drag on forever because time would stand still. But even if the water doesn't freeze completely, it water still flows faster at high temperatures 
than it does at low temperatures. Uh, so much so that a water clock will gain or lose significant amounts of time depending on the weather, a problem that a solid clock uh, is not as prone to. But we can still look to water clocks for inspiration. We can think of our water clock as being filled with thin slices of water all stacked on top of each other like blocks. Now, if we were to open the bottom of our container suddenly, all those slices would fall straight down just like our balled up sock or our five pound weight. But we don't have an open bottom on our container, we have a spout which only allows a certain amount of water to squeeze through at any time. So when the clock is running, a thin slice of water is pushed out of the spout creating a little gap and then all the slices above it drop down. We then replace the water we lost through the spout by putting a new slice back at the top and we're back to the setup that we started with. Now let's look at just one slice, which we've highlighted in yellow here, as it moves its way through the clock. So it starts at the top, but it can't fall because it's being held up by the slice of water directly below it. But once that slice moves down, there is now a gap and our yellow slice falls until it is once again stopped by the slice below it. As the water clock continues to run, it keeps dropping by the same small distance, equal to the thickness of one slice. And as we know from the beginning, anything that drops a certain distance will always take the same amount of time. Obviously, it doesn't happen in tiny little steps like that. It's all happening continuously. But what if we could take those steps and apply them to the falling weight of our power source? What if we were able to drop the weight a little bit and then stop it, drop it a little bit and then stop it, drop it a little bit and then stop it? So instead of it falling a large distance once measuring a relatively large amount of time, we were able to drop it multiple times at very small distances and use that to measure a whole bunch of shorter times. And that is exactly what we are going to do in the next episode where we make our power source do that using a verge escapement. Which brings me to the third and hopefully final lie, at least of this episode. Uh, I promised you last time that next time we'd be talking about the verge escapement, uh, which should have been this time. Uh, and we're not. We're just not. Uh, I fully intended to. Uh, I thought all of this water clock stuff would be a quick and easy introduction to some of the important concepts that we we're going to need to talk about the Verge escapement, and it was neither quick nor easy. Uh, the video, as I originally planned it, uh, was already running long. It's uh, way behind schedule, and uh, I just decided uh, to, to cut it down in the middle. And by the way, no, uh, the irony that all of those problems are time related is not lost on me. Uh, but please tune in next time where I guarantee we are going to talk about the Verge escapement and how we can use it to make our power source uh, convert that constant force and constant acceleration of gravity and convert it into the constant speed we need to run our clock. So if you enjoyed yourself, uh, please make sure to like and subscribe. If you have any questions or comments about the video, let me know down below. And until next time, thank you very much for watching.